the Mobile Workforce Podcast, industry insights, construction perspective. Hello, this is Mike Merrill, the host of the Mobile Workforce Podcast, and today we have Mr. Mike Pasco on. Mike is an attorney and trial lawyer with Han and Losher, one of the top 500 largest law firms in the United States, and he is an expert in all things OSHA and compliance in the construction industry related. Uh, Mike has a wealth of knowledge and experience with his customers that he shares today, tips and tricks and things to help not only keep you safe and in compliance, but also in case you have an OSHA inspection or you're running into challenges with OSHA, he's got some great advice for you. I hope you enjoy the episode today. Well, welcome on to the podcast, Mike. It's a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. You bet. I guess we can call this one Mike and Mike in the morning, right? Right. That's right. <laughs> so Mike, it's good chat. As your lawyer, I would advise you against it. How's that? <laughs> that's probably good. It's probably 18 different shows that have that trademark. So, um, well, Mike, again, uh, it's been a long time coming. We've been talking with you quite a bit about your expertise and your background as it relates to uh, OSHA related items, which are very important for construction. And I just wanted to check in with you and see from your perspective, how do you think the political changes that are going on in the current environment are influencing the activities within OSHA? So it, that's a great question. The, the Biden administration really has been focused on climate, and that led to the national emphasis program that we saw in heat uh, two years ago. And, you know, to to hearken back to before that and the previous administration, there was a significant focus on um, rewarding compliance and uh, really looking at what companies had done to have zero tolerance policies, to enforce safety rules, and those actions were rewarded and citations were vacated for even very serious inju- injuries like we saw in the Suncor case. We had two workers who were inside of a heater and a turnaround for a oil refinery and, and fell from a height of three stories and were seriously injured. And ultimately that ended up, uh, the citation ended up being vacated because of Suncor's very robust safety policy. We fast forward to what's happening now, and this really did start with the heat uh, national emphasis program and has expanded to both trenching and to fall protection. But heat was the the impetus of it, which is a, a, a huge issue for the current administration. We saw OSHA engage in what has become a pattern in practice for them where they will not have a rule per se. I mean, there is heat rulemaking underway, but as we know, you know, from the silica standard, that's a decade off at least. Uh, and, and they they will issue these national emphasis program alerts and will then at the same time issue what they believe would constitute compliance with however they're going to cite you, whether it be for heat a general duty clause violation or a safety standard violation, something along those lines. And they then proactively notify you that, hey, every single time we inspect someone, we're going to tack on a heat inspection. And the a, a year ago, a little over a year, year ago, we saw the first set of statistics from the heat national emphasis program. And I think there were something like five or seven. It's just a handful of actual citations compared to, you know, a thousand plus inspections. And uh, at the ABA OSHA conference, where all of the government and employer and employee side attorneys all come together. You know, the government, the solicitor's office who enforces OSHA policy, uh, trumpeted it as a great success. And there was a question from the crowd from one of the employer side lawyers. Oh, how can you call it a success? You didn't issue any citations. And, uh, you know, I never I never like to be the guy who asks the question at the end of the session and makes everyone stay. Right. Everyone wants to get their coffee and take their break, and get a snack. But I went up afterwards and, and talked to them. And the conversation I had was. You know, look, I view that as a tremendous success because they they implemented essentially without rulemaking a heat safety policy and they got everybody to do it. Right. And, you know, they, they it's it's the play that works. Right. You run the play again. And so they ran it again with with fall protection. They were running again with, with trenching. Right. And they really are using that as a way uh, to advance current agendas and sidestep all of the morass that is rulemaking, like we saw with the silica standard, which took, I think, 26 years to go from 
you know, notice of initial rulemaking to final rule. And even now, the, the, the rule is kind of a nightmare. So that's very fascinating, Mike. Interesting how uh, those changes in administration have such an impact on this. But for the listeners that may not be familiar with HEAT, can you explain a little bit more about what that is and what it pertains to? Sure. So the the issue uh, with HEAT is, you know, it is the number one uh, weather-related uh, cause of injury and fatality in work sites across the country. Uh, and poster case for this is a gentleman by the name of Tim Barber is 26 years old. He worked on a construction site uh, one day. Uh, next day, his, his dad had put his lunch together for him. He was putting his boots on. He seemed a little bit out of sorts, went to work the next day, collapsed and died of uh, heat exhaustion. And, you know, he wasn't paving. He wasn't, you know, doing asphalt. He was sorting bolts. Uh, and he was in the sun and he was unprotected and he was by himself. And so it's an illustration of heat as a hazard and how it can affect, you know, anybody, even people without comorbidities, without, you know, being at a risk factor of age or weight or, in, or health or anything along those lines. And so in, in an effort to address that, uh, OSHA issued notice of proposed rulemaking and is working on a rule for heat. The complexity comes in with the concept of what does it mean when heat is high, right? When is it a danger? And, you know, they OSHA has used in the Sturgill roofing case and, and then in the USPS cases, they've used the National Weather Service chart, which you've probably seen. It has temperature on one side and humidity on the other. And, and it, it has a chart that goes from yellow to orange to red to dark red, depending upon a combination of temperature and humidity. And what, what that says is essentially that, that there is a risk as the temperature and as the humidity increase. And so what OSHA did is, at least in the National Emphasis Program, they said, look, here's a hazard. We're giving notice through this. So we meet our general duty clause requirement to provide notice of a hazard in the industry. Tim Barber in the case here provides evidence that it's a serious hazard likely for serious injury or death. And here's how you abate it, right? Uh, have a rest program, have water available, have breaks and not just breaks, but mandated breaks, right? Have shade available, uh, it put in uh, what are called administrative controls. So potentially start earlier in the day if you're, if it's possible, if you're going to engage in, in paving or other types of activity, um, potentially allow acclimatization if a worker has not worked in that type of an environment, slowly at the, introduce them into acclimatization. And then, of course, you know, the number one is, and this is what happened with, with Tim Barber, is, is training to understand how to recognize what heat exhaustion looks like. Because by the time you get to the point where you are in trouble, you're not sweating and you're not capable of asking for help, right? It, it, it's, it's affected your cognitive process to the point where you, you're incapable of voicing to others, I don't feel well, I need assistance. And and so training people on how to recognize that is a key part of any kind of a program to address heat. Um, and, and that's why it is the number one weather-related hazard in, in our industry. Are you looking to remain OSHA compliant while also keeping insurance costs low? Then you need Safety HQ, the safety app that offers resources like Toolbox Talks and JHAs to help contractors improve their safety practices. Users can also use inspection checklists and real-time reporting to keep up-to-date with OSHA rules. Keep your crew safe. Check out Safety HQ today. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I have a background in construction, and I remember we'd had framing crews, and we're out there sometimes 110 degrees, and you're up on a hot roof, and and, uh, and I'm in Utah, not Phoenix, so uh, a little less extreme than some climates, but definitely a problem. And I think, to your point, a lot of times the body goes more into survival mode and there's some automation that, that your, your body kind of takes over and your brain's not necessarily in sync. So I think, I think there's a lot of wisdom to what you said about the awareness isn't necessarily there, even though there's really quite a bit of danger going on, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, from your perspective, and I, I think I know the answer, but um, what approaches have you seen that, that seem to be more effective to OSHA's um, dealing with these things? And, and do, you, do you feel like there are positive changes coming down the pike or 
Is there more to be concerned about if we're in construction? So, uh, like I said, the the, the heat playbook, um, OSHA really is running with that, right? And and the positive thing about it for safety conscious construction companies is they give you the whole recipe, right? It isn't just here's a danger, go figure it out, right? It's they want to cite you under general duty. And so general duty requires four things, existence of a hazard, awareness of the hazard in the industry, uh, likelihood of serious death or injury, serious injury or death, and a, a feasible means of abatement. And so for them to issue these national emphasis programs and have a chance at success and a citation to enforce them, they, I, they, they try to meet all four of those prongs in these national emphasis program alerts that they give you. And so along with the notice of the hazard comes, in the case of heat, uh, proposed options that would constitute a feasible means of abatement. And, you know, while we don't see that in the national emphasis programs on trenching and on fall protection, because we have rules that relate to those. And so abatement is compliance with the rules. And if you're cited, it's not going to be a general duty clause. It's going to be a violation of a specific standard. We're still seeing in these national emphasis programs uh, information from OSHA on how to comply. And that really is their focus. They're looking for compliance, not necessarily uh, citation. But the trend that we're seeing, and there is a there is a, a recent response coming out from the employer side that we'll talk about more uh, in the presentation uh, at the conference this year. So make sure to attend if you're interested. But uh, OSHA really has gone beyond, uh, in my, this is just my personal opinion, what they're permitted to do. And they really are engaging in rulemaking without going through the rulemaking process. And it's not appropriate for them to do that. It's good. It's good to be safe and and the outcome is positive, but you have to have the checks and balances. And what we're starting to see is there is a challenge now to what's called um, Chevron deference, which is a legal policy of deferring to executive agencies that administer rules. And it it strikes me as uh, the employer's response to OSHA to say, no, hang on a minute, okay? You're not abiding by the rules. You're not getting our input. You're not getting our insight. And so this is our response. It is a little bit of a uh, be careful what you wish for, because I don't think that the outcome from it will be what anybody really wants. But at the same time, you know, when you look at the notice of proposed rulemaking for heat, when you look at all of the conferences, there's tremendous participation from the industry and comments. And in fact, the comment period was extended, I believe, twice to take more comments from the industry because it is such a complex issue. And your point, you know, to being in Utah or Arizona, and we're here in Cleveland, Ohio, right? What's hot to me here in Cleveland may be just a normal spring day to someone in Utah, right? And that's the whole acclimatization process and the concept of, you know, how hot is hot, right? And and when is it a hazard? And, you know, my general response to that and, and what I tell all of my clients is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right. That's the tail wagging the dog. We'll get to a rule. You know, California has a rule. Some state plans have rules. We'll get to a rule. What the practical advice is, is have a program, make sure it's implemented. Right. Make sure that you you ensure compliance with it and make sure everybody's trained on how to recognize what the hazard is. And then you're fine. Right. I mean, that's the practical approach to all of the jockeying back and forth between you know, OSHA and, and the solicitor's offices enforcement and the employer side and employee side. That's the practical response is it is a hazard. We don't know what the perfect answer is, but here's a set of four or five or six things that you could do, right? Just do those things, right? Do those things, keep your workers safe. You know, everyone goes home at the end of the day to their family, which is what we really want. Yeah, I think to your point, I don't know any company that doesn't want their employees to be out there and be safe. Uh, you know, nobody wants anyone getting injured. And I think there are good intentions around. But again, uh, compliance is a tricky thing because there is some accountability on individuals to to take care of themselves also. Um, what are you seeing companies do as far as software or technology solutions or other things to document and to make sure not only number one that they're they're being safe because that's the important thing but number two if there is risk of a violation or something else if they have the documentation to make sure that they are proving that they are in compliance or at least doing their part 
Yeah. So, so the right, we're talking about things like site specific safety plans and various other documentation, right? That's all immediately accessible on, you know, on the iPad, right? It's, it, and, and we're not getting into those situations of, oh, you know, you don't have your site specific safety plan here. You don't, you know, everything is, is accessible. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen potential uses for that for uh, what we call enhanced compliance. Um, so technology as a, as a means of enhanced compliance will have uh, people who have not so much in heat, but maybe a fall protection issue. And so we'll offer what we call an enhanced abatement where uh, we'll have a client say, hey, I understand. Okay, we had people and they were on a roof and they didn't have fall protection. But rather than a citation, right, let's let's get another than serious or let's agree to hold this citation in abeyance and we'll implement an enhanced enforcement program where on any given day, I'll randomly select five of our roofing crews, call it. And I'll send the safety director will send a text message to each of the superintendents. You have two minutes to take a picture of all the guys or women on the roof with their fall protection on. And you got to text it back to me in the two minutes. And if you don't, there's no, I didn't get the text message. There's no, it's you're deemed to be non-compliant and you'll be sent home for the day. Right. And nobody gets paid. And so that's a, that's a way to use technology for compliance. Right. And the, in, and in the, in, the heat context, right? I mean, we all have the relative humidity on our iPhones, right? And we've got location services. We can know exactly what we're doing, where we're doing it, right? And so the technology really has taken away the excuse of, oh, I didn't know, oh, I didn't respond, or oh, I don't have, right? Uh, as as far as a response to any kind of a, a safety incident like that. Yeah, that's a great point. So every, everybody's got an iPhone or an Android in their pocket uh, or an iPad accessible. So I think that's a, a great example of innovation and technology actually blessing the industry. Now, of course, you know, there are software solutions that can help remind and, and validate. Um, I know we hear uh, over the years, I always hear companies talk about, you know, the employee that, you know, took a picture of their time card and they texted in, but the text didn't go in or, or the email bounced or the inbox is full. So obviously there's some next level steps to solutions and processes that companies can invoke to make sure they're in compliance. But I think it's uh, it's great to acknowledge that th there really is no good excuse anymore for not only individuals, but also these companies to to not be in compliance, right? Yeah, that that's right. And, and that is one of the things. So Scott Ketchum, who is, you know, and you got to love these government titles. He's the director of the Directorate for Enforcement for Construction. Uh, but <laughs> that, that, the, head guy, the head guy at OSHA in charge of construction uh, issued a statement about trenching and, and essentially said, there's, there's no reason to have a single trench collapse, injury or fatality. Zero. There is, there is no reason. And, you know, that's, that's what these national emphasis programs are focused on, right? I mean, it's the same thing with fall protection, right? There is no reason to have a fall protection violation. But I mean, I'll tell you, I have a client, very safety conscious client, uh, excellent, robust safety program is stripping forms off of an abutment. And the competent person, the person who gave the toolbox talk that morning on fall protection, gets up to the top of the abutment, unclips, free walks across the top of the abutment, and then rather than go six or seven or eight feet to the right where the ladder is, this person steps down on a railing, the railing gives way and he falls and is, is seriously injured. And so, you know, they're, they're just, it's just in our industry, just takes a moment. It is a very dangerous profession and, and people who do it for a long period of time, they get used to it and they forget, right? And that's, that's what these regulations are for. I mean, it isn't big brother looking over our shoulder. It's the reminder that what people who do the work in this industry, who are out in the field doing it, you know, it, it's dangerous, right? My, my biggest danger at the office is a paper cut, right? I'm not going to get engulfed in a trench or fall off a scaffold, right? And we have air conditioning, you know, but that's not the way it is in, in construction. That's a great example, um, you know, someone actually giving the toolbox talk and then, you know, shortly thereafter actually you know, major infractions and, and missteps, literally. Um, from a, another practical standpoint, do you have cases where maybe 
maybe OSHA was after somebody and they had that validation. And even though there was an accident or an injury, the company did their part and, and, you know, they were, they were good because they took care of those things from a documentation standpoint. So, yeah. So if I understand the question, Mike, it's, it's, it, it, is there the reverse where they did everything right and got cited anyways? Yeah. 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 We had a, we had a client who had a fatality. I was a subcontractor who, who specifically had the fatality, but they're a controlling employer under OSHA's multi-employer. Right. And the citation comes across a couple citations for, you know, failure to warn and a walking, working surface violation. And our response and representation is, um, you know, not true. This dealt with balconies, right? And balconies that that had been installed, it's been set in place. But unlike, you know, what every iron worker will tell you, right? One pin for every connection. Every iron worker will tell you that. And and these didn't have pins in them. And somebody went out on an unfinished balcony, the balcony flipped and fell, and the person was killed. And so the ultimate result for our client was very good, right? We got the major citations um, released or, or, or um, dismissed. But ultimately you know, OSHA wouldn't give up, right? They needed a citation, right? There was a fatality and they, they still do have that mentality that a serious injury demands a citation. And and that goes back to your initial point about differences in administration and philosophy, right? I mean, the Suncor case, and if you look, I mean, there's a write-up on it on, on our blog and on my website, uh, my bio of, of what the case and how it specifically sort of shook out. But the previous administration, the previous focus in OSHA was on compliance, and that compliance really did act as an insulator to liability, and we've seen that a little bit less. Now, you know, there was a whole presentation at the ABA OSHA seminar this year about the rogue COSHO, the rogue compliance safety health officer who goes off and issues these citations and makes a bunch of the things up and doesn't do their job, and you know, OSHA thinks that that's a myth, and the employer thinks that that exists, and all of this. But I, I think the truth really is more in the middle where, you know, you will get movement on citations if you can prove compliance, if you can prove documentation, if you can prove that you did it right. Uh, but it's still not where, at least from the employer side, I would want it to be, which is, look, if I can prove that my client did everything right, they have the documentation, they did the toolbox talks, they have the training, the equipment was on site. And somebody like this supervisor who is the competent person does something silly, right? Yeah. Why would we be cited? Why, 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 why are you demanding that we be cited? And that, that disconnect is still there, right? There's still, you know, we, we did resolve it, right? All of this is public record, so I'm not speaking out of school. It's up, but we did resolve it, but the citation didn't go away. And it just does get to a point, unfortunately, in our industry where because of the nature of our work sites, right, they are mobile, right? I mean, construction projects end and you go to another location. And so unlike general industry, where there is a tremendous focus on fighting absolutely every single citation, you know, a lot of these end up as an other than serious and some kind of a minor penalty, which is frustrating, especially for companies that that do have a great safety record and do have that kind of commitment to safety. Yeah, so... Outside of writing your congressman, you know, the, the common phrase that everybody says, uh, or uh, replacing the administration in the White House, what can companies do to have an impact on how OSHA is enforced in their area and how it impacts them, if anything? Are you looking to remain OSHA compliant while also keeping insurance costs low? Then you need Safety HQ, the safety app that offers resources like Toolbox Talks and JHAs to help contractors improve their safety practices. Users can also use inspection checklists and real-time reporting to keep up to date with OSHA rules. Keep your crew safe. Check out Safety HQ today. Well, so I, I think you I think you fight the citations, right? I think that you, you know, this is this is the the big key is to get get companies to understand how the citation process works, right? And and they all want to get go in for was called an informal conference, right? And, and if you've never done that before, it's always offered. And it's a direct conversation between the company and the the regional or local office. And then the local office wants to resolve it that way. And they'll talk you into you know, a resolution, right? And it makes everyone's job easy and they get a little bit of money and that's the end of it. And what I say to, to my clients is, no, look, um, you don't need me to do that right? Learn how to do it. Learn what the process is, right? Write the letter. 
but start your clock ticking. And you know, when the when the working days expire, you've got to appeal, or right? you've got to file your notice, and you can resolve it at any point. But if it's sort of the it, what what we call in the law an issue evading review, where you have an issue, but it doesn't get into the court system because the economics don't drive it or it's not worth the time. And so that's how you solve this problem. I mean, if you have citations that are coming in and you're compliant, you should fight it, right? And and fight it practically. I mean, the advice we give to our clients is, is to be practical about it. We're not going to scorch the earth on these pieces of litigation, but we're going to get in front of a, a lawyer for the solicitor's office and we're going to prove to them why it's going to make their life difficult, why they're not going to win their cases. And the good ones will listen to you. I mean, I have gotten citations completely vacated. When you get in front of a lawyer and the lawyer looks at it and they say, you know, you're right. I mean, we had a client who, who was doing work on uh, on a bridge, both sides of a river, and a, and a co-show shows up, you know, this is a couple of years ago, national emphasis program, height, you know, serious danger, that used to be the standard. I want to inspect. And so the client's trained on what to do when OSHA comes knocking. At happy, and that's a presentation that we give all the time on, on how to handle that inspection when it happens. Because you got to plan in advance. And if you don't, you're never going to get it right. But they have their opening conference. And the, our, our, my two clients, two guys who were there, walk out the trailer door and both of them go left. And the co-show goes right. And they look at him and they say, hey, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm going to look around over here. And they say, no, you're not. He's like, well, you know, I, I can go wherever I, and if you read, it's interesting. If you read the field operations manual, which is what they give to those co-shows, it incorrectly says that they're allowed to do that. And they're absolutely not, right? This is it. Same as a search by a police officer of your car or your home, right? You get the same constitutional protections. They say, no, you're not. And so he, he finds, a, I forget, it was a, a lack of a labeled life vest and a spreader bar that wasn't labeled properly. But by the time he got across the other side, for the real inspection, right? People falling off a bridge. Everybody had fall protection. They had all their documentation. They had their training, but they got cited. And so, you know, we get into the process and my response is, look, this is a bad search. First thing I'm going to do is file a motion to suppress it. And, you know, she looked at it, the lawyer who was representing OSHA and said, you're absolutely right. Dismiss the case. But that's it. That's an example of, you know, they're doing everything right, but they were also prepared, right? They were ready for when OSHA came in. And and not to knock them, but a lot of the people who are doing training on this are former compliance safety and health officers. And they are giving you the information that they've been given as professionals working for OSHA. And some of that information is wrong. And so they're not being malicious, right? They're imparting their decade and a half worth of knowledge that makes them so well known and so valuable to talk to, but they're getting some of it wrong. And that's the key point. I mean, when I give these these presentations to industry groups and I say things like, you can say no. Right. I get, you know. Oh, stand up for yourself. Right. Yeah. right. You know, and, and it's not that you're, it, you know, it's not that you're doing anything wrong, but, it, you know, you don't get to come fish around my work site looking for some label that might not be in place for that thing. It was, a, that's what it was. It was an unclosed mousetrap and an unlabeled spreader bar, but they weren't using either of the pieces of equipment at the time. Right. And so- that's the frustrating piece on our side of it's what makes it gives OSHA a bad name. I mean, they really are, I think, by and large, trying to do the right thing. And when you talk to people who work for OSHA at these seminars, you know, after they've had a, a cocktail or two, right, their heart is in the right place and they're looking to do the right thing. But they they do sort of get they get out over their skis and don't really understand what's going on. And they get there and they don't get and they think, oh, you know, I, I wasted my time. I got to. I got to get a citation I, you know, maybe you don't, right? Maybe you just give them an attaboy way to have a safe work site. Congratulations. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, it's interesting too. again, as a former contractor, we all know what we need to do to get ready for an inspection. I mean, there's no mystery. It's very rare that an inspector is going to find something that I don't already know he's looking for. And if it's not done, I probably knew it wasn't done and intentionally chose to not do it. So, I think if we as as contractors approach this from the same perspective, we would, you know, a building inspection or a four way or an electrical or a trench inspection where you, you know what they're looking for. I think uh, to your point, you know, there's a lot of these things that just common sense, regular 
preparation and you know uh, normal discussion while also standing up for yourself and and you know making sure that you don't empower an ocean inspector beyond what they really have the limitations to do uh, i think we can avoid and make make our situation a little bit better for ourselves wouldn't you say yeah i think that's 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 absolutely right and and i think that you know the other side of this is and and this is an unfortunate part about what i do i mean I have seen fatalities in video, in people horribly burned and have lost, you know, fingers and, and, and arms. And, you know, it is not anything that you ever forget. And, and thankfully, most people in our industry go through their entire career and they never see anything like that, but they don't realize, right? They don't realize how dangerous it is. And, and if you did, right, you would take that extra step 100% of the time. Right. And you would realize why, you know, you do that. I mean, there are there are accidents in our industry. It is a dangerous industry. But, you know, I'll tell you, by and large, um, the 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 issues that you hear about are, you know, the horrible offenders. And so people get this idea in their head of, well, I'm not a horrible offender, so it can't happen to me. And that's not true. Right. It's just not not true. So from a statistical perspective, and I know we talked quite a bit about heat, uh, what are some of the main uh, issues that companies are getting cited for or what, what should they be more or most aware of just from an overall compliance standpoint? False. Absolutely. Okay. Fault, fault are the number one killer in, in our industry. Um, fault, false from the same height, false from a different height are the number one uh, cause of, of serious injury and death in the construction industry and have been for quite some time. Um, you know, if, if you're looking for what to avoid citations that three national emphasis programs that are on right now are trenching heat and falls. But if, if the question is what causes the most injuries and fatalities in our industry, unquestionably it's false. Okay. And obviously certain trades are, are much more subjected to those, those, uh, dangers, of course. Um, what, well, you, uh, you, oh, you think that, yeah, you think that Mike, that's not necessarily true, Right. A lot of the falls that we'll see will happen, um, you know, when uh, somebody goes back for a set of tools to an area that was closed off and you get an uncovered hole, right? I mean, certainly we could fall. You're right. Roofers and, and people who are doing bridge work, right? You see a lot of that. But, you know, our, our industry as a whole, you know, people work at height. And keep in mind, I mean, three feet, right? Scott Ketchum, again, director, director for construction, his first inspection as a co-show was a fatality from a height of three feet guy fell backwards onto a piece of green bar and so you know yes it is it is true that that is is more prevalent for certain trades in our industry but for the industry as a whole it's it's number one far and away yeah that's a great point i'm really glad you brought that up so falls doesn't mean they're falling down from something necessarily i mean it could be you know from ground level into a hole or like you said, three feet up from a step ladder, or you know, off of a, a little bit of a foundation, or something off, like you mentioned on the rebar. Um, yeah, we're we are in a in a dangerous industry, and and uh, our employees are at risk all day, every day, out there in the trades. No question about it. Yeah, absolutely. So from uh, from the conversation, we've we've learned a lot. I I've learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners have, have had a lot of takeaways. Is there one thing that you would really just advise people in closing that, that you, you know, could encourage them and that you hope they take away from our conversation today? Yeah. Plan and train, uh, plan, plan and train, um, that the anecdote I have for this, and it's, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I had a client who was cited for a failure to train and it was, it was mind blowing to me. And what had happened is the coach who had interviewed all of the employees and all to to a person said, you know, well, we don't have safety training. And what they meant was, it is so integral and such always a part of everything they do that they do on a daily basis that they didn't, in their mind, identify it as something other than job training. To them, safety was such an integral part of their job training that they didn't call it out as separate. And so, you know, look, we got that fixed. We had all the records, but th that's the goal, right? Train and plan. Right. So everybody knows. And and that's that's just 
that's the the number one solution to most of the citations and most of the injuries I see, um, aside from, you know, accidents, right, is somebody wasn't trained or they didn't plan. Mm. Wonderful. That's great advice. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on, Mike. I've loved uh, getting to know you and learning more from your experience. Uh, yeah, I thanks guess, for the opportunity. Oh, I appreciate it. You bet. So, uh, so you're speaking at the uh, Foundation Converge Conference. Um, that's April 22nd through 25th in Nashville at the Omni. What other uh, places are you speaking uh, coming up this year that others might be able to tune in or, or plug into? Uh, so I don't think I have anything else coming up. I just spoke at the Conaway Conference uh, for ODOT, which is our big transportation conference. Um, we had a, a, an NBI, which is a, a, a legal training institute. But I don't think anything else, at least on the schedule yet. Uh, so if I do by the time uh, the conference rolls around, I'll certainly put it up on the on the PowerPoint. That's awesome. Well, this has been great. And again, uh, can you remind the listeners of the website or where they can find your information to get a little bit more in? Yeah, so the, the, the website is hanlaw.com. That's H-A-H-N-L-A-W.com. And just click on our construction blog or look on my profile, all of the articles uh, that I mentioned are linked there. And there's a link to our blog. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Mike. It's been a pleasure and looking forward to catching up again down the road and seeing you in Nashville. Thank you, Mike. Happy to do it. All right. Take care. Thank you for joining us for the Mobile Workforce Podcast by Foundation Software. To hear more episodes, visit us at workmax.com backslash mobile workforce podcast or subscribe to the Mobile Workforce Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast platform. And If you like the show, be sure to leave a five-star review, share with your colleagues, and follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Mobile Workforce Podcast.